All right, Shabbat Shalom and welcome to United Israel World Union. This is our Sabbath morning scripture study. Thank you so much for joining us. It is a pleasure to be back with you this morning. We are in class eight in our series, Prophet. We're talking about the mysterious uh, people and uh, their words, which are actually the words of the Creator. So I'm glad to be teaching on this topic, and I look forward to today's class. Many are the mysteries in this book of books, and we're going to get into some of those today. I've got uh, a class that I haven't taught on this subject in quite a while, so I'm looking forward to it uh, greatly. Open your Bibles this morning to the book of Joshua. We're going to begin in the book of Joshua this morning and go ahead and go to chapter 6 of Joshua. Chapter 6. And I'm just doing something on the technical side here. Okay, so go to chapter 6, and I want to tell you the setting. Most of you probably know this, but the setting in Joshua chapter 6, the children of Israel have begun the conquest of the land which was promised to the fathers. They have just finished the 40 years in the wilderness, and they have crossed over the Jordan into the area around Jericho. Jericho is the first place that the children of Israel uh, take on in the conquest, okay? So that's where we're at. We're in the first uh, part of the conquest of the land, and this is after the destruction. So I want to set this, the stage for you, and I want you to look with me at Joshua chapter 6 and verse 26. Joshua 6 and verse 26, and it says, And Joshua charged them at that time by oath, saying, Cursed be the man before Jehovah that rises up to build this city, Jericho. He shall lay its foundation with his firstborn, and with his younger son shall he set up the gates of it. So there is a curse, an imprecation, if you will, on the person, whoever that will be, who decides to rebuild Jericho after it's been destroyed. Now, this word is spoken by Joshua, and then we don't hear anything about it, not for a very, very long time. But I'm going to use this to enter into today's class uh, because it gives us some context to a very dark period in the time of Israelite history, in the time of biblical history. So I want you to go with me this morning thinking about Joshua giving this imprecation, this, this oath, this curse about the person who rebuilds Jericho. So go with me to uh, the book of 1 Kings, uh, 1 Kings chapter 16, please. 1 Kings chapter 16. And I'm going to follow the white spaces. So I want to begin 1 Kings chapter 16 and verse 29. And in the 38th year of Asa, king of Yehuda, began Ahab, the son of Omri, to reign over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Shomron, uh, Samaria, 22 years. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of Jehovah more than all that were before him. And it came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the sons of Nevat, that he took to wife Isabel, the daughter of Etbaal, the king of the Zidonians, and went and served the Baal and prostrated himself to him. And he reared up an altar for the Baal in the house of the Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made an Asherah, and Ahab did more to provoke Jehovah, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. That's, that's saying something. Ahab, we're talking about Ahab. <clears throat> Ahab in English, by the way. 
in his days did Hiel the Beteli build Jericho. He laid its foundation with Aviram, his firstborn, and set up its gates with his youngest son, Seguv, according to the word of Jehovah, which he spoke by Joshua, the son of Nun. Now we're talking about hundreds of years later. We're talking about uh, a very dark period of time in biblical history, in the history of the kings of Israel. Ahav takes the throne. Now, Ahav is worse than all those who preceded him. I mean, this is, this is saying much. I want you to understand that. And it says that, uh, I wanted to read this part about the fulfillment of an oath that Joshua had uttered after the defeat of Jericho. This is a uh, totally destroyed in, in Hebrew, we talk about a harem, a, to, a ban, a total destruction. And Jericho was under that ban. In fact, after the passage in, Jer- in Joshua 6 that I just read, we have the story of Achan. You remember, Achan takes some of the things from Jericho and to- takes them to his person. And, uh, and he brings sin on himself. Remember the story. There's sin in the camp. Uh, which has become sort of, uh, people talk about this all the time. If something is going on in your life that's not right, people say, oh, you must have sin in the camp. Well, this idea of a harem, it's a total destruction. Not only is it to be totally destroyed, but nothing is to be taken out, and the person who rebuilds it is under a curse. Now, one of the things that we see here. In 1 Kings chapter 16, it says in 1 Kings 16 that Joshua uttered this uh, and it was a word of Jehovah. Now, if we read in Joshua chapter 6, uh, verse 26, we don't see that it says, And the Lord spoke unto Joshua, saying, Say that whoever rebuilds this, whenever that might be, that they will be cursed and they'll, you know, their son will we'll die because of this, basically, is what it's saying. Nowhere do we get that it's from the Lord until we get here to 1 Kings 16, and looking back, the comment is made that that is, uh, that is exactly what this was. It was a word of Jehovah. So one of the things that I want to establish early on in today's class is that there are times in Scripture where a uh, prophetic utterance, if you will, in this case, a curse on the person who is to rebuild Jericho, might not come to pass for hundreds of years. But that word is powerful, and I think people need to really understand that. We didn't read in Joshua 6 that God told Joshua to say this, but 1 Kings 16, looking back, says that's exactly what happened. Now, um, another point, according to tradition, uh, the prophet Jeremiah recorded these annals of the kings that we have preserved in First and Second Kings, but be that as it may. But this sets the stage. What, we, what I wanted to establish is that things are bad. They're very, very bad. Worse than ever in terms of leadership, We have uh, a wicked person, more wicked than any who'd gone before. Now, if you read the biblical history, particularly uh, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, you know, and Judges and so forth, you're going to see plenty of bad kings. But Ahav seems to be chief among sinners, if you will. Uh, So this sets the stage for a very dark period. Now, um, Ahav takes to wife a woman by the name of, in English we say Jezebel. Uh, Jezebel is this infamous Zidonian woman who is even known today as the epitome of evil and wickedness. We say this today in our culture, you know, she's a Jezebel. 
you know, in indicating that she's uh, all sorts of things, you know, that are improper to say on Shabbat. But you understand my point. This is a bad, bad woman. How bad was she? She's pretty bad. She's pretty evil. She's pretty wicked. Her name, E. Isabel, in, uh, in Hebrew, E means where? Uh, and in many Semitic languages, E, 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 where Zevul is glory or dominion. So her name basically means where is glory and dominion? Well, I can almost imagine and put forward to you that she thinks she is it, right? Isabel. Now, we have other names in the Bible, just to kind of give you a, a, a point on this. You, you've heard of Ichabod in English, Ichabod. It means, uh, where, is the, uh, where is the glory? It's another way of saying, where is the glory? Kavod, where is the glory? So in Hebrew, it's, it's uh, Ikavod, Ikavod, where is the glory? Isabel, where is the glory or dominion? <clears throat> now, I give you that background because during this time, during this particular time of bad, this dark period where you have the worst of the worst of kings and his wicked, evil woman, Isabel, um, and it's during this time that we meet with one of Israel's best-known prophets. Remember, Amos says that God does nothing unless he reveals his secret unto his servants, the prophets. So you can almost expect that in the best of times and in the worst of times, when God is moving for the good or for the bad, that there will be in some way the manifestation of his word in the midst of the situation. What we have in this particular case is one of Israel's best-known prophets. We know very little about him. We only have a few select stories that are covered in just a few chapters in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, we know very little other than these stories, but we're going to go through some of these stories today because when I go through this series on prophet, I want to highlight some of Israel's prophets and, and some of their words and some of their deeds and so forth. But this particular prophet that I'm going to talk a little bit about today is not a literary prophet, meaning we don't have a book named for him that contains his words, his prophecies. We have a record of some of his acts and deeds and some of his words, but we don't have a book named after this particular prophet. We know that this particular prophet uh, was operating in the 9th century BCE. So, you know, we're talking the mid-9th century BCE. Now, this particular prophet is known uh, and revered in the religious text and traditions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Basically, two and a half, uh, let's say four million people, nearly half the population of the globe knows about this mid-9th century prophet. Uh, very, very interesting stories. He works miracles. This person, as the Christian writings later put it, and I like this, uh, that he was a man like us, and yet he could control the rain. He could start the rain. He could stop the rain even at his word. Look with me this morning at 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings chapter 17. And the reason that I gave you this passage uh, leading into this today to demonstrate the darkness of the period, it's that what I'm about to share with you, the introduction to this prophet, follows immediately after the announcement that the imprecation, the curse, has been pronounced on or come to fruition on the person who rebuilt Jericho. 
So this is bad times, bad leadership, and in comes verse 1 of 1 Kings 17. And Eliyahu the Tishbi, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said to Ahav, um, let me look at something in the Hebrew. Chai yeah. Yehovah, this is an oath. He, he's making an oath as the Lord God of Israel lives. So, so this prophet, when he steps on the scene, Elijah called the Tishbite from Gilead. That means he, he dwells east of the Jordan. You know, the land of Gilead, look at your Bible map in the back of your Bible. Hold your hand here and look. You'll see that it's east of the Jordan in this region, right? That's where he's from. And he makes this oath. He says, uh, as Jehovah, God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, there shall not be dew or rain these years, but according to my word. Now, we've never heard of Elijah. We've never heard of Eliyahu Hatishbi. We don't know who this is. There's no record of his birth. There's no record of his family. He just shows up in the worst of times. And he shows up. Not only does he show up, he shows up in the face of the king Aha. Aha, this evil king. And he, he, he shows up and he makes this oath. Um, this is pretty interesting. And he tells him there's not going to be any rain. Now look, look at uh, chapter 18, verse 1. We're talking about his ability to control the rain. 18.1, And after, uh, and it came to pass after many days that the word of Jehovah came to Eliyahu in the third year. So this is three years after he's pronounced there won't be a drop of precipitation, basically. The word of the Lord came to Eliyahu in the third year, saying, Go appear before Ahav, and I will send rain upon the earth. And Eliyahu went to appear before Ahav. Now look down at verse 41 of 18. I just want to highlight the person of Eliyahu Hatishbi, Elijah uh, the Tishbite, uh, 41, 18 and 41. And Eliyahu said to Ahav, Go up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of the rumbling of the rainstorm. So Ahav went up to eat and to drink, and Eliyahu went up to the top of the Carmel, and he crouched down on the earth, put his face between his knees, and said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, There's nothing. And he said, Go again seven times. <clears throat> and it came to pass in the seventh time that he said, Behold, a little cloud is ascending from the sea like a man's hand. And he said, Go up and say to Ahab, Prepare your chariot. Get thee down that the rain stop you not. And it came to pass in the meanwhile that the sky became darkened with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain, and Ahav rode and went to uh, Jezreel. Now, interesting in this particular story, Elijah is the rainmaker. Now, throughout biblical history and on into the Second Temple period, these traditions of rainmaking and control of the weather become one of the stories that fits into many of these different stories that we have, that we've inherited. But this idea begins with Elijah. He can control the elements. Now, it's interesting. <clears throat> we don't have in the story that Elijah is praying, Jehovah send the rain. We just have a, a picture, an image of him on the Carmel, and he, he gets down and he puts his head between his knees. And it could be praying. We don't know. But he tells uh, this servant, hey, go look. Tell me what you see. There's nothing. Now go look again. Do it seven times. On the seventh time, he says, I, 
I see a little cloud. He goes, it's coming. Now, over the years, growing up in a different religious tradition, I've heard some great sermons preached on this. You know, just all it takes is just, if you can just see a cloud the size of a man's hand, you know, this is how God works. But it was a storm that came. And it came because of Elijah's word. I think that's very important. But it's not only that Eliyahu is a person who can command the elements, but he also does other miraculous things. According to uh, the few stories that we have, one of the other miracles, look at chapter 17 of 1 Kings 17. I want you to go to verse 8 of 1 Kings 17. Uh, This is at the white space, by the way. And the word of Jehovah came to him, saying, Arise and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Zidon. By the way, who's from there? Remember? Itzabel. Jezebel's from, from there. And dwell there. Behold, I've commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Zarephath, When he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. Now, people have pointed out that this is very similar to the story in Genesis 24 of Abraham. You know, where his servant goes uh, to get a woman for Isaac. And there's a woman there and so forth. Um, As she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in your hand. Now remember, this is famine. This is a time of great famine and drought. So he's asking of this widow woman, Can you give me some water and oh, whip me up a loaf of bread while you're at it? You understand, this is... Now watch what she says. And she said, verse 12, As Jehovah your God lives... Um, this, by the way, is that oath. Chai Yehovah. So she's basically saying, I swear to Jehovah. Uh, I have nothing baked but a handful of meal in a jar and a little oil in the cruise. And behold, I'm gathering two sticks that I may go in and prepare it for me and my son that we may eat it and die. And Eliyahu said to her, fear not. Go and do as you have said, but make me a little cake of it first. Somebody said, typical preacher. And bring it to me, and after, make for you and for your son. For thus says Jehovah, God of Israel, the jar of meal shall not be spent, neither shall the cruise of oil fail until the day that Jehovah sends rain upon the earth. Uh, Let's see where I want to go to here. Uh, Let's see. And she went and did according to the word of Eliyahu, and she and he and her house did eat many days. And the jar of meal was not consumed, and neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of Jehovah, which he spoke by Eliyahu. This is unprecedented in many ways, to this point in biblical literature. These are miraculous things. She has only enough uh, oil and only enough flour to make just enough for a final meal. She thinks that we're going to eat this and then uh, I'm going to die and my son's going to die. This particular son does die or gets on the verge of death later in the story. And Elijah, we are told, uh, puts himself on top of the child. By the way, he's staying in this widow's house in a little room that she's prepared for him. And he brings this child, this lifeless child, and puts him on the bed and stretches himself upon him. And then he brings the child back. The child, he says, your child, the boy is alive. So we have this prophet who is performing miracles. He can start and stop the rain, controlling the elements, doing miracles, making oil last. This prophet can call down fire from heaven and does so. 
We're introduced to this particular prophet, Eliyahu, after we meet for the first time Ahab and Jezebel, and we learn that Jericho has been rebuilt in these troublesome times. Even in his own day, you ever hear the phrase, a legend in his own time? And that's the case with Eliyahu, at least according to what we read. Word began to spread about this miracle-working prophet. Now, you think about other prophets in the Bible. We have a few miracles here and there, particularly, uh, I'm talking about in the literary prophets, but they do a lot of pantomime. They act things out to bring the message of Jehovah. But I'm talking about miracles. We have a sundial in one particular instance, a few miracles. I'm talking about raising the dead, <clears throat> multiplying oil and flour and starting and stopping. This is unprecedented. But rumors were beginning to spread even in Elijah's day. In 1 Kings chapter 18, <clears throat> one of the stories that we meet with, the word on the street was that Eliyahu would be in one place and somehow Jehovah would transport him to another. These stories are already circulating. He go, well, did it happen? I don't know, but that was, that's what they said. There's one particular story uh, when the famine of the drought is so great, uh, one of these stories takes place. Uh, Jezebel, uh, our wicked Zidonian woman, the infamous Jezebel, is killing the prophets of Israel. And there's one person who is trying to save them from this wicked Jezebel. His name is Obadiah. Obadiah is protecting uh, the, the uh, prophets from Jezebel's wickedness. Look at chapter 18 <clears throat> and um, verse 1. We read this a moment ago, but to set the stage for this. And it came to pass after many days that the word of Jehovah came to Eliyahu in the third year, saying, Go uh, and appear before Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. And Eliyahu went to appear before Ahab. So it talks about how there's this great famine in the land. And uh, Obadiah, if, you, if we were to continue reading, Obadiah is the one, he is close to Ahab and Jezebel. They know him, he knows them, but he's secreting away in caves prophets to protect them from this wicked woman. Now look down at verse 7 of uh, chapter 18. <clears throat> and uh, by the way, so, so what happens, let me give you the context quickly, that the, the drought was so great that Ahab tells Obadiah, look, let's split up because we need to find pools of water because even the beasts are dying and, and we're not going to have any burst, uh, burden, uh, beast of burden. We need to find them water to drink. So we'll split up. You take this part of the country, I'll take that. So that's what's going on. Verse 7, And as Obadiah was on the way, behold, Eliyahu met him, and he knew him and fell on his face. And he said, Art thou my Lord Eliyahu? And he answered him, I am. Go tell my master, behold, Eliyahu is here. And he said, what have I sinned that you would deliver your servant into the hand of Ahab to slay me? As Jehovah your God lives. Notice how frequently people give this oath in the Hebrew Bible. Because in Deuteronomy it says, you shall swear by the name. These people are, these common folk, kings, queens, Everybody is swearing. But, uh, uh, Jehovah Chai, they're saying, they're swearing. As Jehovah your God lives, there's no nation or kingdom where my Lord is not sent to seek you. And they said he's not here, and he made the kingdom and nation swear that they had not found thee. And now you say, go tell thy Lord, behold, Eliyahu is here. And it's going to come to pass 
as soon as I'm gone from you, that the Spirit of Jehovah shall carry you, whether I know not. And so when I come and tell Ahav, and he can't find you, he's going to kill me. You see that? His concern is that he's going to leave and say, Elijah's here, I'm going to bring you to him. When they get back, he thinks Jehovah might have already pulled him and sent him to Jerusalem or something. So he's, he's scared of this. Uh, Though I, your servant, fear Jehovah from my youth, was it not told, my Lord, what I did when Jezebel slew the prophets of Jehovah, how I hid a hundred men of Jehovah's prophets, fifty in a cave, fed them with bread and water, and now you say, go tell your Lord, behold, Elijah is here. He's going to kill me. And Elijah said, as Jehovah of hosts lives, here's that oath again. He's saying, I swear to God, before whom I stand, I will surely show myself to him today. So Obadiah met, went to meet Ahab and told him. Ahab went to meet Eliyahu. And it came to pass when Ahab saw Eliyahu that Ahab said to him, Is it thou, thou troubler of Israel? And he answered, I've not troubled Israel, but thou. Well, I love Elijah. And you're Father's house, in that you have forsaken the commandments of Jehovah. You followed the Baalim. Now, therefore, send and gather to me all Israel to Mount Carmel and the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of Asherah, 400, who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent to all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah drew near to all the people and said, How long will you go limping between two opinions? If Jehovah be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, Not a word. And then said Elijah to the people, I only remain a prophet of Jehovah, but the Baal's prophets are 450 men. Now listen. One thing that Elijah does frequently, we only, we only get a few stories about him, but three times he makes this statement, I am only left, it's just me. He was convinced. And part of that is, if you read the story of the prophets, they are forced through the nature of their horrible mission, uh, they're alone. Now, He's convinced that he's the only true prophet. And uh, we see this here. We'll see it also in chapter 19. But what this particular passage does, it sets the stage for a great showdown, if you will. A showdown between uh, the God Jehovah and the Baal. Now, Uh, We're not going to get into Baal, but Baal, by the way, is known as a Canaanite god uh, that's also associated with rain and storms and weather. So here you've got Elijah who can start and stop the rain because of Jehovah, and you've got a false god who is being credited with this same power. Uh, Now... The great showdown takes place from this point where I left off. And and what you see is this wonderful literary story. And uh, you see Elijah mocking this God. You know, there he said, you go first. We're going to take the sacrifice and I want you to go around. And, and whoever sends fire from heaven, if you're, you go first. If your God lights this, this sacrifice, then yeah, okay, you're God's God. Uh, but, but they're out there, and they're dancing, and there are 450 of them. Now, we don't hear any more about the 400 prophets of uh, Asherah. Uh, it's, it's like that piece of the story falls out. We, we now are only focus on the 450 prophets of Baal. But the 450 prophets, they're dancing, they're gashing themselves, they're screaming out, and uh, Elijah's over there saying, you know, maybe you should talk louder. I mean, he is a God, you know, maybe he's, maybe he's on vacation. Maybe he's relieving himself. Maybe he's busy. So just, 
and he, he's picking at them. You know, he's, he's stirring them up. This guy is courageous. You have to give it. He's a radical monotheist, and he's in the face of his opponents. Um, but ultimately, the story tells us that these false prophets are destroyed. Uh, they're killed. The, the victory is to Eliyahu because despite the fact that he drenches the sacrifice on the altar that he's rebuilt, ultimately fire comes from heaven and even licks up the water. And of course, Jehovah is the declared winner in this. This sends Jezebel through the roof. So Jezebel says sort of some dirty language. It's cleaned up in English, uh, but she says, come morning light. I'm going to do the same thing to you that you did to this. Uh, you, you thought you were cool with what you did here. I'm, I'm going to kill you. And so um, he, he flees. Now, it's like an intermission in the class, like a curtain closes and it opens up. Go with me to the book of Malachi. Go with me back to Malachi. And I want to go to Malachi chapter 3 and verse 22. And if you're in an English Bible, go to Malachi chapter 4. And verse 4. Now this, these are the final words of the prophets. This is it. This is the end of the prophetic words in the Bible. Okay? It's a final exhortation and a final prophecy. And at the white space... In verse 22 of Malachi 3, or 4.4 4 in English, it says, Remember the Torah of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel, both statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Eliah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of Jehovah, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the land with a harem, with a curse, with a ban to utter destruction. So in the final words of the prophets, we have an exhortation to, uh, to turn to, to remember the Torah of Moses, my servant, that he commanded at Horeb. By the way, uh, for my Deuteronomy group, uh, this is the preference in Deuteronomy. It's always referred to as Horeb, Horeb, never Sinai, right? So this idea is to remember the Torah. And then it's the same text, the same pericope as we've, we've talked about, the same prophetic utterance. It goes right into... This idea that Eliyahu, that Eliyah is coming before the great and dreadful day of Jehovah. Elijah? Elijah is coming before the great and terrible day. Hmm. Now that's interesting. This is the end of the biblical period, end of the prophet. And they're talking about Elijah is coming back. Interesting. And then, and then I like to point this out, especially for prophecy students like you are, uh, is that we have what I call an either or prophecy. Like a lot of people, when they study eschatology and the end times things, they begin to look at all the prophecies. You know, we have to have a temple. The temple has to be rebuilt, and we have to have sacrifice, and we have to have this, and we have to have that. And then there's also this idea. Uh, that says they will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain that the sacrifices won't be. You know, and people begin to say, well, how does that happen? Well, they begin to try to order it. But listen to me. Not every prophecy 
has to come to pass. Now, before you turn off the video, don't get nervous. Let me give you an example. I just did. Eliyahu is coming. Elijah, uh, in this mission, call it the second coming of Elijah, right? He came once. Uh, he ascended into heaven, which we'll talk, and he's coming back. He's coming back. It's been a while. It's been a while, by the way. Some people might scoff and say, where is the sign of his coming? After all, the fathers have fallen asleep, and we don't, haven't seen this Elijah who departed into the heavens. You know, people could scoff at that, couldn't they? Yeah. But look, it says, he will turn the heart of the fathers... He will turn the heart of, let me look at it in Hebrew. He will turn, cause the heart of the fathers to turn upon the sons and the heart of the sons upon the fathers. That's part one. Okay? Part one of that verse gives that option. Right? Uh, remember last week when I talked about a disjunctive accent called the Athnach? It divides the verse into two constituent parts, basically. The first part of this is Eliah's El El coming before the great and terrible day of Jehovah, and he will cause to turn the heart of the fathers upon the sons and the heart of the sons upon the fathers. That's one. That's one option. Either that's going to take place. There's going to be a turning of hearts, fathers to sons, sons to fathers. That's part one. Part two is a whole nother option. Not both. It's either or. Look at the next part. Lest, lest I come and smite the land with a harem, with a curse. So when Elijah comes, whenever that is, a lot of people have lost faith in the second coming of Elijah. But let's say that Scripture is true and this same Elijah who went up is coming back. Let's say that's true. Don't scoff. People have scoffed at this. But let's say he's coming back. When he comes back, this is going to be the option. Now, about the coming of Elijah. Is this uh, Eliyahu the prophet in any way connected to our coming um, messenger? I mean, think about it. it. If we look at the broader context within which we find this particular uh, prophetic utterance, it's part of chapter 3, which doesn't necessarily connect the two. But look at 3.1 again, Malachi 3.1. Uh, Behold, I send my messenger, and he shall clear the way before me. Uh, is The question is, is Eliyahu the messenger who is coming? to prepare the way. Remember last week we talked about, uh, if you look in, in chapter 3, verse 1 here, it's, Hini Sholeach, behold, I am sending Malachi, my messenger. Behold, I am sending my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. Uh, who is the me here, Right? Now, we're going to get into quite a bit about messianic prophecies, and I'm going to use air quotes, messianic prophecies, uh, beginning next week for sure. But I want to get this very, very clearly stated. When it talks about preparing the way, last week we talked about that. Whoever the messenger is in Malachi 3.1, whose job it is to panuderic Adonai, panuderic Yehovah, 
that particular task is also mentioned of one in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 3, in Isaiah chapter 57 and verse 14, in Isaiah 62 and verse 10. So when we look at those particular passages, we begin to build up. My question is, is Eliah the messenger who is coming? Now, you might say, well, are you suggesting we could put a name to this messenger? Uh, an identity more so than just a vague, ambiguous, perhaps, it's a question. Now look at back at Malachi 3.23, Malachi 3.23, uh, in Hebrew, it, where it says, Behold, I will send you Eliah the prophet. In Hebrew, it's, Hine anochi sholeah. Now remember in the messenger up above, it's Hini Shaleach. Behold, I'm sending. And here it's Behold, Anochi. Hine, behold, Anochi Shaleach. Behold, I am sending. Now I got curious <clears throat> sometime back. You know, I like to look at words and phrases, and I'm looking for more to identify who is this coming one? Who is the messenger that we're looking for? Who is this? And I started looking for words and phrases in the Hebrew Bible, and I found something that I want to share with you today. In Hebrew, the phrase, Hine anochi uh, shaleach, behold, I am sending. I wanted to find, did God ever say this anywhere else? Anywhere. How many times does that phrase appear? Hine anochi sholeach. Behold, I'm sending. One time. Only once in this exact form. So you can imagine that when I saw that it was only used once, of course, I was looking at the results on the screen, and I saw the verse that it was in, and I thought, ah, interesting. Never would have seen that coming. One time in all the Hebrew Bible, uh, it's interesting that it, too, has to do with the sending of a messenger. One other time, Jehovah says, Hine anochi sholeach, and it has to do with sending a messenger. So I thought that if perhaps I could find that messenger, that perhaps I would be looking at a little bit of help with the identity of this messenger in Malachi chapter 3. Go with me. By the way, it's in the Torah. Go with me to Exodus, the book of Exodus. Let me get a sip of coffee. And go to chapter 23, Exodus chapter 23, and verse 20. Exodus 23 and verse 20. Behold, I send a messenger before you to keep you in the way and to bring you to the place which I have prepared. Now, interesting, it has to do with uh, a messenger who is going to guide them by Derek in the way. Remember our uh, Panu Derek to prepare the way. This is, this is very interesting that whoever this messenger is, is being used to go before the children of Israel to guide them in the way. All right. Now, who is this Malak? Who is this Malak? We're going to begin in verse 20 again and read through to the white space. Behold, I send an angel, some translations say. But in Hebrew, it's Malak. Malak, a messenger. Could be an angelic messenger. Could be. Uh, we're going to look at that today. Uh, Behold, I send an angel before thee, a Malak, to keep thee in the way and to bring you to the place which I have prepared. Take heed of him. And obey his voice, provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. But if you shall indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy to your enemies. Notice the switching. If you listen to him, I will. Right? 
and I'll be an adversary to your adversaries. For my messenger, you know what that is in Hebrew? Malachi. For my messenger shall go before thee and bring thee in to the Emory and the Hitti and the Perizzi and the Canaani and the Hivi and the Jebusi, and I will cut them off. You shall not bow down to their gods nor serve them nor do after their works, but you shall utterly overthrow them and completely break down their images. You shall serve Jehovah your God and he shall bless your bread and your water and I will take sickness away from you. Now, you see how I just read through all that. But look, um, I will cut them off. I will. Who's speaking? I will cut them off. You shall not bow down to their gods or serve them. And you shall serve, verse 25, Jehovah your God and He. Notice third person. Who is speaking? If it's Jehovah speaking, which seems likely because that's the one who's going to smite and destroy these inhabitants, seems it would be more uh, natural or less awkward if it said, and you shall serve me and I will bless your bread and your water. Because there it says, and I will take sickness from your midst. You see how it's back and forth? Interesting. People miss this all the time. What I want you to do is to begin focusing on the switching of the persons back and forth and back and forth. Okay, so the final prophetic word declares that Elijah is to be sent. Now, how is that possible? You see how I switch back? Uh, and how is that possible that a 9th century BCE, mid 9th century BCE prophet, a Navi is to come again. Go back to 1 Kings. Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings 19. And I want to show you an interesting story uh, about Eliyahu. Eliyahu, after the slaying of these false prophets, he in fear and in flight... Head south, Jezebel is out to kill him. So he heads south. He stops in Beersheba, and he begins to go. Look at verse 1 of uh, 1 Kings 19. Okay. Uh, and Ahab told Jezebel all that Eliyahu had done and how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. And Jezebel sent a messenger to Eliyahu saying, so let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not your life as the one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life, came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, left his servant there, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat under a broom tree. He requested for himself that he might die and said, It's enough now, Jehovah. Take away my life. For I'm not better than any of my fathers. And as he lay and slept under a broom tree, behold, a malach touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baked on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. And the malach Jehovah, it's literally the messenger Jehovah. It's translated the angel of the Lord sometimes. This is a messenger Jehovah. Let that sink in just for a second. This is a messenger, Jehovah. Came again the second time, touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in strength of that meal forty days and forty nights to horror of the mountain of God. And he came there to a cave and lodged there. Behold, the word of Jehovah came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Eliyahu? And he said, I've been very jealous for Jehovah, God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant. Who does he think he's talking to? Right? Your covenant, right? Thrown down your altars, slain your prophets with the sword, and I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, whoever this is, go out and stand upon the mount before Jehovah. Now, what is he talking about? Is this Jehovah speaking? Would it be more natural to say, go and stand on the mountain before me? I'll meet you over there. 
And behold, Jehovah passed by. And a great and strong wind rent the mountain and broke the rocks in pieces before Jehovah. But Jehovah was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But Jehovah was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But Jehovah was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. When Eliyahu heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out, stood in the entrance of the cave. Behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, like not missing a beat, I've been very zealous for Jehovah, God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altar, slain your prophets with a sword, and I only only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Very, very interesting encounter. The question is, we know that the Malak Yehovah meets Eliyahu and gives him food to sustain him for 40 days and 40 nights at Horeb. Now, this is interesting because Eliyahu is is depicted in this story as another Moses. He's at Horeb. He's got this Malak Yehovah who is in the story as well. He is sustained for 40 days and 40 nights without food and water. Who is addressing him at Horeb? Is it the Malak? The Malak Jehovah, the messenger Jehovah? Very interesting. And then he gives uh, Elijah a mission. He says, uh, you're going to leave here. And he gives him this strange mission. You're going to anoint this person, this king in this country. It's not even in Israel, right? And you're going to anoint this person. In your, and by the way, you're going to pick your replacement. Now, uh, Johnny Powell, years ago, I was studying with him years and years ago. And uh, he suggested that it's almost like Elijah's getting fired. You go, no way, not Elijah. But it's interesting. The thought, because three times he said, I'm the only one. And later we find out that he's not the only one. There's some thousands who haven't bowed the knee to Baal, right? Enter Elisha. Elisha. Go with me to 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 2, please. 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 1. 2 Kings 2 and verse 1. And it came to pass when Jehovah was about to take up Eliyahu into heaven by a storm wind. This is a good story. These are the stories that made me fall in love with the Bible as a little boy. We ought to be reading these to our kids. Let me tell you about Elijah. About to be taking up Eliyahu into heaven by storm wind, that Eliyahu went with Elisha from the Gilgal. And Eliyahu said to Elisha, Remain here, I pray thee, for Jehovah has sent me to Bethel. Elisha said to him, Watch, he's going to swear. Don't you to see that when you read these stories in the biblical period, these people were swearing as the Torah commanded them. Yehovah Chai, as Jehovah lives, Chai Yehovah, as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel, and the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Know thou that Jehovah will take away your master from your head today? And he said, Yeah, I know it. Hold your peace. And Eliyahu said to him, Elisha, remain here, I pray thee, for Jehovah has sent me to Jericho. And he said, Chai Yehovah, as Jehovah lives and as your soul lives, I'm not going to leave you. So they went to Jericho. And the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elijah and said to him, Know you that Jehovah will take away your master from your head today? And he answered, Yes, I know it. Hold your peace. He's frustrated. He's like, Yes, yes, I know. Like your, your teacher is about to depart. You don't, want to, you don't want everybody, Hey, did you know? Yes, I know. And Eliyahu, verse 6, said to him, Remain, I pray thee, here, for Jehovah has sent me to the Jordan. And he said, Chai Yehovah, and as your soul lives, as Jehovah lives and your soul lives, I will not leave you. 
And they too went on. And 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and stood opposite them afar off. And the two stood by the Jordan. And Eliyahu took his mantle, rolled it up, struck the water, and it was divided on one side into the other. And so the, the two of them went over on dry ground. Notice, again, another similarity between the Moses and, and even the Joshua uh, story. More so Joshua in this case. It came to pass when they had gone over that Eliyahu said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for you, for I am going to be taken away from you. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. And he said, You've asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I'm taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it will not be so. And it came to pass as they went on and talked that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them from one another. And Eliyahu went up by a storm of wind into heaven. And Elisha saw it and cried, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and their horsemen. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. And he took up also the mantle of Eliyahu that had fallen from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. And he took the mantle of Eliyahu that had fallen from him and he struck the water and said, Where is the Lord God of Eliyahu? And when he also had struck the water, they parted to one side and to the other, and Elisha went over. And when the sons of the prophets who were in Jericho saw him, they said... The spirit of Eliyahu rests on Elisha. The spirit of Eliyahu rests on Elisha. We are in some very interesting text in the Hebrew Bible that many people don't pay close attention to. We've got the story of miraculous, the raising of the dead. We've got stories of of a prophet who touches the water and the water parts. And we've got this interesting story about the spirit of a prophet coming on another person. Now, this shouldn't be new to us because in Numbers chapter 11, we have the story uh, where the spirit of Moses is placed on the 70 elders, right? So this is a possibility. Remember, Moses said, I wish that all God's people were prophets and that Jehovah's Spirit were on them. So in this case, though, in Numbers chapter 11, the spirit of Moses is put on, is shared. Here we have Eliyahu's spirit placed on Elisha. At least that's what the people say. It's interesting. Now, it's interesting, too, because... This passage says that the spirit of Elijah rests upon Elisha. Now look, there are a lot of texts in the Hebrew Bible. I've looked at every single one of them closely in the Hebrew that talk about the spirit. And the spirit can rush upon, the spirit can enter in, but only one other text in all of the Hebrew Bible says the spirit resting. Only one other text And it's in Isaiah chapter 11. In Isaiah chapter 11, go with me there. Just I'll touch this because I don't want to spend much time on it this week. But in Isaiah 11, this is the only other place in the Hebrew Bible that mentions the Spirit uh, resting on one. Verse 1 of chapter 11 in Isaiah, There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the spirit of Jehovah shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of Jehovah, and so forth and so on. This is for another class, though, because we have to ask, who is this person who's described here? We get into Isaiah chapter 11, we're into what we call messianic. See my air quotes? Messiah is not mentioned anywhere in these texts, but we'll talk about that another day. But I want to go back to the Malak Yehovah, the one who fed Eliyahu and prepared him for this long trek uh, and these 40 days without food at Horeb. 
Go with me to Exodus chapter 3 and verse 1. Exodus chapter 3. We're talking about uh, the messenger who goes before Yehovah. Exodus chapter 3. I just want to begin and just touch on a few things about this messenger. Uh, Beginning in verse 1, Exodus 3. Now, Moshe kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock far away into the desert and came to the mountain of God to Horeb. Now, look, this Malach Yehovah likes to hang out at Horeb. Watch closely. This is the mountain of God, it's called. And the Malach Yehovah appeared, the messenger Yehovah, appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, but the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I'll now turn aside and see this great sight while the bush is not burnt. And look at verse 4 carefully. And when Jehovah saw that he turned aside to see, who, who's in the bush? The Malach, Jehovah. And now it says, and when Jehovah saw he turned, God called to him out of the midst of the bush. So is it the Malach Yehovah, is it Jehovah, or is it Elohim? Who's in the bush? God called to him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moshe, Moshe, and he said, here am I. And he said, don't come near, put off your shoes from off your feet, for the place on which you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And Jehovah said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people, and so forth and so on. Now, the question becomes, though, who is there with Moses? This is the point I want us to begin to look at. We have a switching. We, we clearly indicate in the text that it's the Malach Jehovah, the angel of the Lord, if you will, the angel of Jehovah, the messenger Jehovah, more literally. And, and here we've got uh, this switching back and forth as we work our way through. Um, behold, verse 13, Moses said to God, Behold, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they shall say to me, What's his name? What shall I say to him, them? And God said to Moses, I will ever be what I am now. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, Ehie has sent me to you. And it goes on. Now go with me to Judges chapter 2. I've got a few more of these passages I want to go through this morning. Judges chapter 2. We're talking about the messenger. Uh, Look at verse 1. And the Malach Yehovah, the messenger Jehovah, came up from Gilgal to Bochim, white space. And then it picks up. And said, I caused you to go up out of Mitzrayim, out of Egypt, and it brought you to the land which I swore to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall put down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Moreover, I said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as snares to you, and their gods shall be a trap to you. And it came to pass... When the messenger of Jehovah, the Malach Jehovah, spoke these words to all the children of Israel, that the people lifted up their voice and wept, and they called the name of that place Bochim, which in Hebrew means weeping, and they sacrificed there to Jehovah. So again, here we've got the messenger of Jehovah, the Malach Jehovah, saying, I brought you out. I did. I did. Okay? Look at Judges chapter 6. And I'm not going to get all these, but verse 11 at the white space. And there came a messenger of Jehovah and said unto the terebinth, which was in Ophrah, that belonged to Yoash, the uh, Avizri, and his son Gidon, 
was threshing wheat by the winepress to hide it from Midian. And the messenger Jehovah, the Malak Jehovah, appeared to him and said to him, Jehovah is with you, you mighty man of valor. And Gidon said to him, O my Lord, if Jehovah be with us, and why then has all this befallen us? And where are all his miracles, which our fathers told of us, saying, Did not Jehovah bring us up from Egypt? But now Jehovah's forsaken us and delivered us from the hand of Midian. And Jehovah turned to him and said, Listen, Jehovah turned to him and said, Go in this thy might, and you shall save Israel from the hand of Midian. Have not I sent you? And he said to him, O oh, Jehovah, what shall, with what shall I save Israel? My family is the poorest in Manasseh, and I am the youngest in my father's house. And Jehovah said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall smite Midian, and so forth. And, and it goes on. Now look down at verse 20. And the messenger of God, um, the Malachi Elohim, said to him, Take the meat and unleavened cakes, lay them upon the rock, pour out the broth, and he did so. And the messenger of Jehovah stretched out the end of the staff that was on in his hand, touched the meat and the unleavened cakes, and fire rose up out of the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened cakes. Then the messenger Jehovah departed out of his sight, and Gidon perceived that he was a messenger of Jehovah. You, you understand, these stories, they give the impression, Jehovah looks at Gidon and says, you know, it's like he's talking. He looks like a, like a man, like a human. And, and, and he says, go in this might, you know, thus has said Jehovah. He says, wait a minute, Jehovah's with us, and why does all this bad happen? Uh, a similar thing happens in Judges chapter 13, where uh, Manoach, Samson's uh, father, and, you know, and they meet, and the Malak comes down, and uh, you know, there's it goes up in the flame of fire. I mean, these stories, it's it's a very fine line. At times, they appear to be human and functioning on the human realm, but they know they are known by those with whom they speak either from the beginning or at some point during the conversation, that they are in fact Jehovah. Now, at times, throughout the biblical period, throughout biblical literature, these figures, these malachim appear, and, and you know, at times they're, as James Tabor put it, uh, born of a woman. They, a messenger can appear like one that's born of a woman. Uh, we have Haggai, for instance, in Haggai 1.13, where he's called the messenger of Jehovah of hosts. Haggai is, okay? But th that's not, that doesn't mean that Haggai is the one who meets Gedon, you see. Now, a lot of people want to say, well, look, it's not some ethereal, mystical, angelic kind of being that we're waiting for. And I say, how do you know? I mean, biblically, like some people could listen to this and go, well, Ross is absolutely crazy. He's talking about, it. look, this, the book has mysterious things in it. We have the Malachim that are described in the text. But somehow this Malach, Yehovah, is, is there at times when God's uh, communicating Jehovah's word and his will in the human realm, whenever that takes place, this Malach Yehovah is often there. Um, we first meet the Malach Yehovah in Genesis 16 with Hagar. Remember that story? Look at, look, by the way, let's look at Genesis 22. Genesis 22. Um, and the story of the Akedah, it's called the Binding of Isaac, Genesis chapter 22, <clears throat> and uh, look, look at verse 11, 22 verse 11 first. Uh, and then an angel, or Malach Yehovah, called to him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, lay not your hand upon the lad, neither do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God. The Malach Yehovah says this, right? 
Now look down at uh, verse 15. And the Malak Yehovah called to Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, By myself I have sworn, says Jehovah, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, that I will exceedingly bless thee and I will exceedingly multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore and your seed shall possess the seed of the gate of its enemies and in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men and they rose up and went together to Beersheba and Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. Look with me at Genesis 28. I've got a few more texts to go through quickly. Uh, Genesis 28 and uh, uh, verse 10. This is the story uh, when uh, Jacob leaves. Jacob went out, verse 10, chapter 28. Jacob went out from Beersheba and toward Haran. He lighted on a certain place, tarried there all night because the sun was set. He took one of the stones of that place, put it under his head, lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth. Top of it reached to heaven, and behold, the messengers, the Malachim of Elohim, are ascending and descending on it, and Jehovah stands at the top. So, uh, Jacob has this vision of heavenly messengers, plural, up and down, up and down on the ladder and so forth. And then, of course, uh, towards the end where he wakes up, uh, look at verse 16. Jacob woke out of his sleep and said, Surely Jehovah is in this place, and I knew it not. He was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place? This is no other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Look at 32, Genesis 32. And the reason, I just want to show you that the Malachim are showing up at key places. Genesis 32, verse 1, And Jacob went on his way, and the messengers of God met him. And when Yaakov saw them, he said, This is God's camp. And he called the name of that place Machanaim, the two camps. Look down at verse 22. 32, 22. Jacob, he arose that night, took his two wives, his two women servants, his 11 sons, passed over the ford at Yavok, and he took them and sent them over the wadi, and he sent them uh, over that which he had. And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled with him a man until the breaking of the day. And when he saw, now it's a man he's wrestling with, right? When he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Yaakov's thigh was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. And he said, I will not let thee go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? He said, Yaakov. He said, your name shall no more be called Yaakov, but Israel. For you have contended with God and with man and have prevailed. And Yaakov asked him, what's your name? Tell me, I pray thee, your name. And he said, why is it that you ask after my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of that place Peniel, for I've seen God face to face. He wrestles with uh, a man. He calls the place, I've seen God face to face. Who's he wrestling with? Look, look with me, go quickly to Hosea. Hosea chapter 12. And let's see what Hosea thinks. Hosea chapter 12, beginning in verse 3. Jehovah has also a controversy with Judah and will punish Jacob according to his ways. According to his doings, will he recompense him? He took his brother by the heel in the womb, and by his strength he strove with God. He strove with a malak and prevailed. He wept. He made supplication to him. He would find him in Bethel, and there he would speak with us. What is this talking about? You mean to tell me Jacob is wrestling with a malak who's referred to as God? Look, we have ideas about theology and, you know, we have certain um, statements of fate that are based on Platonic and later uh, Greco. I mean, look, people, 
But when we read the Bible, we encounter many mysterious things. We have Jehovah face to face with these people. Very interesting. Look at Genesis 48. Genesis 48. And just in case you didn't catch that, he, the one he's wrestling with, it's called in Hosea a Malak, but it also says his name is Jehovah of hosts. See, people try to tone that down a little bit, like, well, maybe it's not really. It's, well, I'm just saying, what does it say? We'll worry about what it means later. Uh, Genesis 48, this is where Jacob is um, blessing the sons of Joseph, 48.8. And uh, Israel beheld Joseph's sons and said, Who are these? And Joseph said to his father, They're my sons whom God has given me in this place. And he said, Bring them, I pray thee, to me, and I'll bless them. And the eyes of Israel were dim from age so that he could not see. And he brought them near to him, and he kissed them and embraced them. And Israel said to Joseph, I had not thought that I'd see your face. And lo, God has shown me also your children. Joseph brought them together. You know, he brings them up. You remember the story. They switched the hands. Um, and he bowed down. And Joseph took them both. Uh, let's see. Ephraim in his right hand. Israel uh, toward Israel's left. And Manasseh in his left hand toward Israel's right. He presented them to him. Israel stretched out his hand and laid it on Ephraim's head who was uh, the younger in his left hand upon Manasseh's head. And he blessed Joseph and said, uh, God, before whom my fathers walked, Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God who has been my shepherd all my life long until this day, the messenger, the Malak, who redeemed me from all evil, blessed the lads. The messenger who has redeemed me from all bad, bless the lads. Interesting. Exodus 14. Exodus 14. I'm wrapping things up. Exodus 14, 19. And the Malach of God who went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them, and the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. And it came about, so this messenger is stationing itself between Israel and the rest of the camp. Look at Exodus and the uh, enemies. Look at Exodus 32. Exodus 32 and verse 34. And it says... Therefore go, lead the people to the place of which I have spoken to thee. Behold, my angel or my messenger or in Hebrew, Malachi. Malachi. Malachi shall go before you. You see how silly that sounds? Malachi, my messenger shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I punish, I will punish their sin upon them and Jehovah plagued the people. Exodus 33, verses 1 through 3. And Jehovah said to Moses, Depart and go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt, to the land of which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, To your seed will I give it. And I will send a messenger before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, Perizzites, uh, the Hivites, the Jebusites, into the land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in the midst of you, for you are a stiff-necked people, lest I consume you on the way. It's not just in the Exodus, in the former days, uh, that the Malak is mentioned. It's mentioned throughout, and the prophets touch on this as well. I want to give one more in Isaiah. Isaiah 63, interestingly enough, Isaiah 63 says this, uh, verse... Uh, 8, um, it says, For he said, Surely they are my people, children that will not lie. So he was their deliverer. In all their affliction, he was afflicted, and the malak of his face saved them. 
In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. He bore them and carried them all the days of old. The Malak saved them. Genesis 18, some of the most mysterious passages. We have uh, Abraham is in the tent in the heat of the day and he lifts up his eyes and he sees and behold, the Jehovah appears before him, Shalosh HaAnashim, uh, three men. Wait a minute. Jehovah appeared before him and he looks up and he sees three men. Shlosh HaAnashim. Who are these? Then later we have Jehovah who's speaking with Abraham. Shall I? He's speaking to himself, but Abraham's with him. And he goes, should I share with Abraham what I'm about to do? For surely he'll be a great nation and so forth. And then, then in chapter 19, we have the two messengers, Malachim. Who, who are these? Are they Jehovah? Are they Malachim? Or Malachim Jehovah? In, in Genesis chapter 19 and verse 24, when the destruction takes place, it says that Jehovah in heaven caused fire and brimstone to rain down from Jehovah. Jehovah in earth and Jehovah. Look, the Hebrew Bible has some very mysterious things. Many are the mysteries in this book of books, words spoken long ago that are fulfilled hundreds of years later. They, though they tarry, wait for it. If it says that Eliyah is coming... Eliah is coming. In what way is Eliah coming? I don't know, but people are scoffing and saying it's been thousands of years. It has been. But when the prophetic clock strikes, Eliah will come again, just as Malachi says that he will. There are either-or prophecies that we have to consider. Mysterious switching back and forth, the person from first person to third person. Jehovah is speaking, and the next thing you see, Elohim, and then Jehovah of hosts, and the Malak, and who's in the bush. We have all these mysterious things, but we have to pay attention as we read this particular passage. The Spirit of the One resting on another that I spoke of from Isaiah chapter 11. Let me ask you this. Is that one of Isaiah chapter 11 the Messiah? Join me next week as we begin to study passages that are called Messianic. Shabbat Shalom, Shavuot.